Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our spring program for the Minnesota Peace Initiative. Welcome back to those of you who are, have attended our previous programs, and welcome also to those of you joining us for the first time. Thank you all for taking part in our first webinar program. On behalf of the Norway House Board and Organization and our Minnesota Peace Initiative Committee, we want to acknowledge all that our country and our community has been through this year. Many lives have been lost. Our trust in institutions has been tested and we have experienced both the need for social distancing as well as the need to pull together as a community. Tough times are just that, tough. But they can also be a catalyst for reflection, growth, and the strength to do better going forward. That is our hope for all of us, our community and our country. After months of sheltering in place, we are all getting used to these online get-togethers. Nonetheless, I want to quickly review the format for tonight's program. This is a webinar program. Therefore, the panelists and I are on the screen. We can see and speak to each other. We cannot communicate directly with you, but you can ask questions. To ask a question, just look for the Q&A function and that where it is located on your screen will depend upon the device you're using. A window will appear and you can type your question and press enter to send. Our committee will collect your questions and we will get to as many as time allows. You can leave the webinar by selecting end and leave the meeting. For those of you attending for the first time, let me tell you who we are and why we do these programs. Norway is a trusted global peacemaker. Therefore, as part of the Norway House, the Minnesota Peace Initiative provides a forum to delve deeply into challenging global issues. Like James Madison, we believe a well-informed electorate is essential to effective democracy, particularly in this election year. We bring you experts to share their knowledge and insights so we can become better informed about important timely topics. Of the many topics we have covered, a few are actually cringeworthy. That is a topic that makes you wanna pull the covers up over your head. Next to nuclear warfare, the topic of cybersecurity or the lack of it is probably the most cringeworthy topic we have had. Our goal this evening is not to make you a cybersecurity expert. However, our goal is to raise your awareness as to how insecure the internet is, how it got that way, and what we need to do to make it more secure. In a nutshell, as our use and dependency on the web has grown, a collect it all and connect it all mindset has prevailed. However, the growth of devices and applications and users has far outpaced any regulation or other security in the current web. Security was not designed into the internet at the beginning. The democratization of the web, that is open access to all, has been one of its most admirable features. However, as it has moved from its infancy as a tool of academia and the military, into the mainstream of our lives, the need for greater security and more rules of the road is now both obvious and critical, not only for our personal security, but for the security of our democracy and our nation. We have all heard of cyber attacks on business, government, and the military. Attacks in which credit card information social security numbers, and perhaps even nuclear codes have been stolen by nefarious players, whether nation states, criminal networks, precocious teen techies, or disgruntled former employees. Most of us have had some aspect of our identity hacked. 
whether it is emails, credit cards, personal identity, or something more serious. So how vulnerable are we as a consumer, a nation, and as a global military presence? What are our businesses and government leaders doing to protect us? What is the government doing to protect us, our government data, and our elections? What are companies doing to protect important personal data we entrusted them as consumers? What should we be doing to protect ourselves and our data? We will be discussing all of these questions this evening. Whenever you want to pull the covers over your head, it's always good to know there are experts working to keep these risks at bay. We call them cybersecurity experts. They serve in government, the military, and the private sector. This evening, we have three cybersecurity experts who will share with us not only the current threats and efforts to defend against them, but also future threats and what it will take to stay ahead of those as well. Our three panelists this evening are Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. Secretary Simon is a graduate of Tufts University and the University of Minnesota Law School. He served as an Assistant Attorney General and in private legal practice prior to his election to the Minnesota House of Representatives in 2004. After 10 years of service in the Minnesota House, he was elected the 22nd Minnesota Secretary of State. He has served in that position since January 2015. Brigadier General Stephanie Horvath. General Horvath received her BA degree from North Dakota State University and her master's degree in military strategic studies from the United States Army War College. She serves as the Chief Business Technology Officer for the Minnesota Boards, Councils, and Commissions and the Enterprise Program Management Office. She works to ensure that the technology needs of the business requirements of the partners and provides critical insight into IT projects across state government. Previously, General Horvath held the position of Executive IT Director, where she coordinated audits, implemented enterprise-wide process improvements, managed consolidation waves, leveraged organizational improvements, and led enterprise-wide projects. Prior to joining the Minnesota IT Unit, General Horvath was the Chief Information Officer for the Department of Military Affairs. General Horvath is also co-chair of the Cybersecurity Summit, a consortium of industry, government, and academic leaders working together to improve the state of cybersecurity on domestic and international levels. She continues to serve in the Army National Guard. David Notch, IT Executive, Medtronic Corporation. Mr. Notch is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Morris and holds a master's degree in computer and information science from the University of Minnesota Institute of Technology. He currently leads the security and cloud architecture practices for Medtronic and has served as director of cybersecurity services for KPMG and as chief information security officer for Thomson Reuters. In addition to his corporate roles, he also has experience as a cybersecurity entrepreneur, as president of Intensity Analytics. We are going to begin the evening with a brief opening statement from each of our three panelists. We are going to begin with David Notch. David. Thank you, Janet, for that introduction. And, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me here this evening to present the business view of what cybersecurity and the, the threats and solutions really mean to uh, an, an enterprise in, um, in the business environment today. I'm gonna to take you briefly through some of the risks, some of the 
challenges that we're facing and some of the potential solutions to those and what the outlook is. Uh, so really, really the outlook for the next couple of years. So first of all, we'll go through what the costs are to an enterprise today and, and what that really looks like, what the cost of a breach is, what some of those threats are, what, what do we face every day, not only domestically, but also internationally. This is not, of course, limited to any particular country or, or region. And also, how, what can we do to reduce the costs of a, of a breach and some of the workforce challenges that we're facing today. And then finally, I, I'd like to leave you with something that if you have concerns of your own, um, some good resources that you can use to help protect yourself and your family and, and others that you may know. So I would like to try to leave that. So first of all, uh, what does it cost? So there's a, a study that's been going on for quite a few years now, and it's, it's, it's quite well done. And it's from the Ponemon Institute and IBM. Also, their security uh, business also participates in this. But they survey a number of, of businesses and that have had breaches. And what, is, what has it cost them? I think on a, from a global standpoint, the average, the average cost of a breach today in 2019 and 2020 is almost $4 million. Interestingly enough, in the United States, it's almost twice that. Uh, for a number of reasons, we won't get into all those reasons, but I think it's important to notice that it does depend where you at, where you are at, uh, what the regulatory environment is, and, and how, um, how many of those regulations you need to meet as a business. Interest, interestingly enough, healthcare is one of the highest, if not the highest, um, vertical markets um, that cost the most, frankly. Uh, a couple other data points here. Global spending, so that's the cost of a breach. Global spending on cybersecurity, what businesses are spending to mitigate those risks. Um, IDC, one of the top firms that, that surveys this data, uh, estimates it costs about $103 billion in 2019, which is almost a 10% increase from 2018. So a significant amount of money is spent on preventing these breaches. Uh, Gartner as well, is roughly in the same ballpark, about 114 million in 2018. Again, about a 10 to 12 percent increase year over year. So we're really looking at some pretty significantly increasing numbers, and this is somewhat independent of what the overall economy is doing. Um, in fact, with the latest um, coronavirus issues and everything, we've seen uh, attempted attacks actually rise significantly uh, as people try to take advantage of businesses that may be concentrating on other things at, at this moment in time. So it's this really knows no economic um, has no preferences to what the economy is doing. So again, root causes, I think it's interesting to look at this. Um, as far as root causes, about half of it, roughly half, is from malicious or criminal attacks. Almost a quarter is just from system errors and another quarter from human error. So it's not always about hackers. It is about um, just you know plain old human error or coding problems or errors in, in the systems. And when we break down the cost of a breach, it really gets broken down into four areas. So uh, detecting it and escalating it once it's discovered um, is about a quarter of the cost, a little over a quarter of the cost. Notifying those affected, um, while a small number is not ins insignificant. At the bottom, you see what it costs to clean it up, uh, which is another about a quarter of the cost. Uh, and then finally, what's the lost business? That's you know, roughly, is that 30, 30% or so? So the largest portion is actually the business that you lose because of a breach and, and the public trust that you lose uh, because of a breach. Again, this is also from the Ponemon study. A little more, um, not the best news here, but we're also tracking uh, what is the cost over time. And you can see it does go up slightly. There was a dip in 2017, but generally the trend is up as far as what does it cost a business. And secondly, what's the probability of a business being breached? over a two year period. And it's, it's nearly 30%. So almost a 30% chance that any business over the next two years will, will suffer a data breach, which is pretty significant, frankly. Um, a lot of data here. I just want to focus on a couple items. Um, if we look at the, the left side, you'll see that organized crime is responsible for about half of the breaches today. And that's largely thereafter the monetary gain from selling personal data um, or financial data or compromised financial accounts. There is still a significant portion of nation state affiliated attacks and they're really after intellectual property or um, government secrets and that sort of thing. So still those two are the top two uh, perpetrators of this sort of thing. And again, you see towards the bottom here, system administrators and end users, there's still a significant portion there and those are largely mistakes and errors. Some of that is malicious, but the majority of it is really 
just people making plain mistakes and systems not being robust enough to detect those mistakes before they happen. So that's, and then on the right hand side, the only number I really want to draw your attention to is the top right. And that is what's the action that's, that's being taken and still today phishing, in other words, the links that you get in email that go to malicious sites is still the number one um, cause of these breaches. That's the number one way that, that the um, attackers actually get into the system. So we're still year over year, that still is the number one issue. Now that's really the overall status. What, what's the most common? I think what's interesting, um, this year, so the RSA conference is the world's largest security conference. It was held in San Francisco in February, actually right before um, the COVID lockdown. And there's over 500 papers that were submitted. And, and Greg Day, who works at Palo Alto Networks and was on the committee that selected the papers for the presentations. And he did some analysis of that and took out the biggest, what are the biggest trends or, or the hotspots. And this is a good, I think, a good way to look at what's coming because these conferences tend to focus on what's next versus what's happened in the last five years. So I think if you look at number one, uh, fakes and deep fakes, this is where people are taking videos and audio and making it look like people said, said things they shouldn't. Obviously this has ramifications in, in election fraud and, and, and um, basically influencing people in ways that they normally wouldn't be influenced by using um, fake data and that sort of thing. So that's, it's interesting that that was actually the number one uh, thread for the conference and, and topic for the conference. There's others here I'm not going to go through, but I thought that this doesn't show up on the historical data, but I expect that we'll see quite a bit of this uh, in coming years. Then finally, what, what can we do? And this is really specific to a business. I don't want to go into any specific businesses. I'm not representing any particular business here. This is really an overall industry view. Um, and again, the data breach report actually has some interesting numbers about how businesses can reduce the cost of their breaches. And this shows, you know, from the top one being for, forming an incident response team. So being able to detect and respond to incidents um, rapidly and quickly and effectively is the number one way you can reduce the cost of a breach. You know, see most of the top ones here are really process and people focused. They're not technology. Uh, other than, you know, using encryption and a couple there, it's really around dealing with how people are trained and how they use the systems that really go into um, effectively managing security. And at the bottom, you'll see that there are things that amplify the cost of a breach. So, you know, failure at compliant, meeting compliance objectives, um, the complexity of your systems, um, a number, you know, a large number of third parties involved that you don't have direct control over, those things that can actually amplify the cost of a breach. And then finally, the workforce, this is a topic that is discussed extensively in the cybersecurity field. And, basic, and essentially, it's the shortage of qualified cybersecurity experts and engineers and so on. And globally, this came from a cybersecurity workforce study that's done by ISC Squared, which is um, one of the largest, if not the largest, security certification bodies um, in the world. And they do this on a regular yearly basis as well. And interestingly to note, Globally, there, there will be a shortage of nearly 4 million um, people to fill open positions for cyber. In North America alone is over half a million, which is um, significant. I mean, obviously it's significant. And one of the few areas where we have this sort of shortage uh, of people to do the work. And in the upper right, you'll see um, the current workforce, what their education level is and their age, and also the bottom right, what those um, salaries can be. So you, you can see it's it's a well compensated field. Um, it does draw from all the way from high school to doctorate, postdoctoral, um, people that have postdoctorates, graduate degrees, and ages really spans um, the gamut as well. So this isn't, re this kind of field really needs all types of people, whether they're technologists or business people or um, humanities, social, um, social sciences, there's there's really room for all of that. So I'm hopeful that we can can draw from all these areas, not just the hard sciences and not just from computer science. We really need um, people drawn from everywhere. And then finally, I'll leave you with this, uh, protecting yourself. Um, this is not a problem that 
you know, any one business or government can solve on its own. Um, there is, um, you do have to take some personal responsibility in this and make sure that your, your systems at home and um, other things that you use that your, your kids use perhaps and that you use and your relatives and so on have to be secure as well. No one can necessarily do that for you. So this is actually a, a good site to stay safe online.org. It is sponsored by a number of large organizations, both um, you know, NGOs and, and commercial um, large businesses. And this is really, this is a nonprofit and they've put together some really nice background um, on how you can stay safe online uh, and protect those, um, protect yourself and those um, that you love. So, um, so Janet, thank you. That's all the comments I have to open uh, back to you. Thank you very much, David. We are now going to hear from Secretary of State, Steve Simon. Secretary Simon. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. As you might know, our office handles a wide variety of duties. But the one duty that most people know about, that most people think about, that we're most closely associated with, is our role as the Chief Elections Administrator in Minnesota. So as a result of that responsibility, I often like to say that I am in the democracy business. And what a challenging time to be in the democracy business. Of course, we're all in the middle of a pandemic right now. And there are a lot of reasons why we're planning for that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about another threat that we face. But before doing that, I want to just zoom out a little bit and talk about Minnesota's great record. And this is relevant to the subject at hand. We have a fantastic reputation in Minnesota for running clean, effective uh, elections. And people in Minnesota really like to vote. For the last two elections in a row, we have been number one in the country in voter turnout. So we have a record and reputation to defend. But I do worry, of course, about COVID-19, but I also worry on, uh, in a broader way about what I think is the number one challenge and threat to the integrity of our elections in Minnesota and nationwide. And that is the prospect that some adversary of the United States might, as they did in 2016, attempt to intrude into our election system, attempt to mess with the instruments of our democracy um, and, and, and get involved that way. And so um, that is a huge threat. And I think to understand the scope and the gravity of the threat, it's important to talk about what happened in 2016, the last presidential election, since we're now in another presidential election. In 2016, Minnesota was one of the 21 states whose election systems was targeted by a foreign government, period. That's not subject to debate or dispute or uh, uh, any sort of alternative vision of the facts. That's what happened. That's what all 17 of our federal intelligence authorities tell us happened. So what actually happened? I guess asked a lot the question, well, what do you mean we were targeted? Does that mean we were hacked or weren't we? Tell me what you mean by that. And the best analogy I can give is a parking lot. Picture some thieves casing a parking lot and maybe they come a couple days in a row. They've got binoculars, they've got listening devices that are observing traffic patterns. They're looking for a way in to get a car. What the intelligence authorities have told us uh, unanimously, often and recently, is that in 2016, we had car thieves casing our parking lot. They know who they were, they know who those car thieves were working for, and they know the purpose for which they were trying to get into our system. Now, nothing bad happened. The bad guys were kept out, the system worked, and that's good. But of those 21 states, two states were not so fortunate. In Arizona and Illinois, to varying degrees, there was a breach. In Illinois, if I can extend the analogy, I would say that they not only got into the parking lot, they got in the car and started the engine. Uh, and so that's something we're terribly worried about. And the intelligence authorities tell us now it's not just the one government, it's multiple governments and perhaps non-governmental actors who have both the appetite and the capability to do that again. Doesn't mean they will, but they have the appetite and the capability. So I want to talk a little bit about what we've done through uh, since 2016. Number one, in our office, we've set up structures, security teams, working with private vendors and with government to make sure that um, we're doing all the things that need to be done from the standpoint of testing, hardening our systems, and so forth. But I also have to give a tip of the hat and credit where it's due to the federal government. After a rocky start and a rocky relationships with, with the states and Secretary of States, they have really stepped up. Starting in early 2017, when they designated our election systems in this country to be critical infrastructure. Now, that's not just happy talk. That's a phrase that has real meaning in federal law. Critical infrastructure is a designation that had previously been enjoyed only by sectors like the power system, the banking system, hospitals, military bases, you get the idea. And now since early 2017, 
we who do elections are in that sector as well. And what it means is primarily two things. Number one, it's a message to foreign actors that if you mess with this stuff in these categories, it will invite a swift and severe response. Secondly, it um, uh, makes available to us a lot of federal expertise and resources. So for example, we routinely do penetration testing and other exercises with folks from the Department of Homeland Security who literally will come to our office with a team of people, six or seven people, and try to hack us. They will camp out for a work week and try to find vulnerabilities. They will write up those vulnerabilities and then they will um, explain to us what they think we have to do to plug any holes. Those things have hefty and large price tags. So we've also been able to enjoy federal money for exactly this purpose, to beef up federal uh, and, and state election security. And that's a good thing. Um, I would say this going forward. Um, I can't guarantee any more than any institution can, whether it's US Bank or Target or anyone else. I can't tell anyone and look them in the eye and say there's a 100% chance this year that nothing bad will happen. I can't. I can't do that in an intellectually honest way. What I tell you is we think the possibility of a problem is remote, that we're doing things that the federal government have urged us to do. I can mention that Minnesota is in a much better position compared to other states because we are a paper ballot state. We still vote the old fashioned way, pen and paper. It's hard to hack paper. So I'm less concerned, I wouldn't say unconcerned, but less concerned with mischief in the polling place itself, with ballot tallies, with machines and the like. Where I am more concerned and where everyone is more concerned is not there. It's with the large databases that we in every state run for the purpose of voter registration, absentee balloting and the like. They are centralized and they are run out of our office and they took millions to build and will take millions to improve and maintain. That's where the vulnerability is, but I feel that we're in an okay spot. I guess I would just end by saying that um, it's no different as to the Secretary of State's office or government as it is to any private or nonprofit uh, firm or organization as well. And that is that this is a race without a finish line. It really is. Cybersecurity generally is. There is no tape that you cross. There is no doing an end zone dance at the end of some mythical victory because there isn't any. You have to say one step of the bad guys all the time. And so that's what we're going to do this election. I'm confident that we will have a good outcome. I'm confident we're doing the things we need to do, but we always have to be vigilant uh, given that appetite and that capability that is out there and growing uh, when it comes to intruding in our elections. Thanks. Thank you very much, Secretary Simon. Before we hear from General Horvath, I want to let you know that after the General's opening statement, we will begin the live portion of our program. Therefore, now would be a good time to prepare and submit any questions you have. Also, our speaker slides will be available on the Norway House website, along with the recording of tonight's program. Now, General Horvath. Good afternoon. I wish we could be together in person, but appreciate the Norway House Minnesota Peace Initiative for adapting a way to continue the conversation on cybersecurity. If only there was a mathematical formula or expression to secure the internet. Using the term calculus is applicable here because they're really trying to apply a method of reasoning to understand the causes or reasons to explain why the internet is not secure. And the first reason is simply, the internet never was secure, even from the start. And there are several articles online that's come to the same conclusion. Bruce Schneier in 2014 offered an article in Wired, the internet of things is wild, wildly insecure and often unpatchable. The task to secure the internet is boundless. Asking people to secure cyberspace may be as extensive and immense as if we ask people to secure space. But there are diligent people who are trying, working tirelessly to secure the organization's data and networks. Unfortunately, the fact is we've reached a point where too much is reliant on too few. A quick example from this dark reading article. The top three cybersecurity myths and what you should know. Myth number one is that the security team is going to protect me. This is now a logical flaw. There's just not enough trained and experienced cybersecurity defenders. There are too many attacks that bypass the security defenses that defenders put up in the first place to protect organizations. And complexity does not favor the cybersecurity defender. 
where we have now reached this fog of more. The fog of more was coined by Tony Sager, who is the founder of the Center for the Internet Security. Tony worked for the NSA for 35 years, specifically testing DoD systems. He worked closely with those who were in charge of defending those systems. And he found that they were quickly overwhelmed by too many devices, too many operating systems, too many software programs, and too many tools. So now that we've laid out a few reasons that there are too few defenders trying to secure an entire domain that was never securable, and we keep adding more devices. So what has been the outcome? Heavy cost in terms of spending more money to secure companies. The bar chart on the left depicts a steady increase in global cybersecurity spending. The forecasting starts in 2012 and goes into the future, and you can see the general trend in the line graph. The line graph on the right is the amount of monetary damage caused by cybercrime that was reported to the ICE from 2001 to 2018. Then the updated chart below shows the 2019 monetary damage was 3.5 billion. The ICE is the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center that received complaints from actual victims. The strategy of compliance and blinky lights has not proven effective to flatten the curve on monetary damage caused by cybercrime. However, it's not our strategy alone that is a failure. It's the fact that the black hat or the nefarious actor, their strategy is working tremendously well. And their strategy is all about automate, 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 and collaborate. The MIT article on your left is excellent. It really delves into the dark web that hosts a variety of cyber attack as a service, marketplaces and forums that cater to the criminal, um, cyber criminals. The article on the right discusses the use of machine learning and AI in black hat hacking. So now that we've examined some of the reasons to describe our current state of insecurity, what changes can we make in our strategy in the calculus? And to explain those changes, I'm going to use a comparative analogy to the current COVID response and present some ideas that are helpful in slowing the spread of cybersecurity threats, which is our near-term strategy, and also highlight the whole of nation approach initiatives that are being formulated right now as part of the longer term strategy to secure the cyber ecosystem. Slowing the spread, the ideas presented here are very people-based. The more the merrier, all are welcome to contribute and participate to address what's coming as David pointed out earlier with the 2020 cybersecurity risks. Upskill training. IT professionals and IT security professionals are already doing this, but it would be great if companies, organizations, the government uh, helped with their training and helped to train more by incentivizing, helping to pay for certifications and degrees that cost money. High level design principles. This is introducing security as a property early in the development of software programs and any device that has software in it. From applications to software and autonomous driving vehicles, they must include security as a property and that the design principles must be brought in early into the development. Applications that are large and interconnected with other applications are full of vulnerable exploits. There are more examples of software assurance frameworks that companies and vendors must incorporate into their products. SOAR is an uplifting, a term that has emerged and it describes security orchestration and automation, which is a trend to have a very systematic effort to accelerate, document, and improve testing on applications. Web applications are under constant attack. Organizations.orgs like OWASP are emerging as standard bearers, continuously improving upon standards to secure web applications. The CSA is another example. Cloud Security Alliance is an organization dedicated to improve cloud security. These groups are working together to secure the tech. And there are other organizations that are working together to share information. ISACs are information sharing and analysis centers, groups of people coming together to share information specific to their, to their industry. 
So you'll see MS ISAC is the multi-state information sharing and analysis center, and FS is a financial sector, but there are there is an ISAC for everyone, let's put it that way. Going on to the whole of a nation approach, here are two reports that are focused on restructuring the government to marshal resources required to achieve national cybersecurity objectives. The first, the report on the left is the President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee report, published in 2018. The NASDAQ brings together executives from major telecommunication companies, network service providers, information technology. They all come together, bring their ideas forward through this committee to the president to provide advice to him. In the diagram that's taken from the report, you can see the objective is a safe and secure internet. The report on the right is a Cyberspace Solarium Commission. This is chaired by Senator Angus King from Maine and Representative Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin. The Solarium Commission is all about developing a protective strategy described as a layered cyber deterrence. Layer one deals with shaping behavior, layer two, denying benefits, and layer three, imposing costs. Quickly, let's take just a snapshot of the NASDAQ report. The goal is to achieve a safe and secure cybersecurity environment for critical services. It encompasses six pillars, technology, human behavior, education, ecosystems, privacy, and policy. Specifically, there is a focus on technology. Many technologies people have heard of. The report goes into more details in the, in, on the importance. You can kind of see them listed here. Certainly the takeaway is the NASDAQ is focusing on the key technologies that are fundamental to realizing a safe cybersecurity environment in the future. The Solarium Commission report takes a different approach. One, shaping behavior. You can see in the shaping behavior, there is a setting of there is work towards setting international information and communication technology standards and improving international tools for law enforcement. This could be very effective in holding humans behind the actions more accountable than ever before by establishing more um, common ways and appropriate ways for working in the cyber domain. Deny benefits is making it harder for the human cyber criminals to attack our data and information and is moving more towards creating a secure cyber ecosystem. An imposing cost is looking at the military and other instruments of national power to deter cyber attacks. At the state level, there's numerous interesting initiatives that are happening. North Dakota has the K-20 initiative which is literally bringing cybersecurity education to every student. Michigan is evolving a, and developing a Michigan Cyber Civ Civilian Corps, which is a group of trained civilian technical experts who individually volunteer to provide rapid response and assistance to the state of Michigan. Here in the state of Minnesota, Governor Walls has established the Blue Ribbon Council on Information Technology with a group specifically looking at cybersecurity concerns. Cyber is defined as relating to the characteristics and cultures of computers, information technology, and virtual reality. You know, we think of the cyber age. But the word cyber is a shortened version of the word cybernetics, which was first defined by a gentleman in 1948 with his book called Cybernetics. And it was really the science of communication and automatic control systems in both machines and living things. I think it's important to look at the word cyber and the origin of the word cyber and cybernetics. Cybernetics comes from the Greek word meaning to steer and govern. We need to keep in mind just how important it is for all of us to participate in cybersecurity as it is really about the control of the information systems that underpin our society and our way of life. That's all I have. 
Thank you all very much for those very informative opening statements. As you can see, we are pre-taping the welcome and the opening statements. Since this is our first webinar, we want to do everything we can to make this program go as smoothly as possible. Therefore, we want to focus our energy tonight on the live portion of the program, which begins now with our panel discussion, which will then be followed by your questions for the panelists. Again, thank you all for joining us. We hope you find this a thought-provoking evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the live portion of our program. I'm gonna start with a question for each of our panelists, but thank you all for already submitting some great questions. So I will work those in as we go through our question uh, period. My first question is for you, General. You gave a very thorough <laughs> and deep presentation of just a tremendous amount of work that's being done on a cooperative basis to try to create some uh, greater security on the internet. But I'd like to just take a kind of a 20,000 foot look and say, um, can we, or should we even expect security on the internet? I mean, in the digital age, is everything moving so fast? Is it unrealistic to even expect security on our part? Uh, good evening. Great to be with everyone. Um, although it was a little interesting to like watch myself. So that was a kind of a fun experience. Um, okay, to the question. Um, we can reach a point of some reasonable expectation for cybersecurity, but we really drastically need to change the strategy on how to get there. Uh, the current strategy quickly characterized is you know, we've got companies and individuals that are divided and working in isolation. Their IT and IT security staff work day and night in this endless accelerating hamster wheel, trying to patch vulnerabilities and their bleary eyes are staring at all the blinky lights. And so the change is really about how do we unify where we have a collective us, a collective us regardless of industry, but more of a national us, that is us versus perpetrators of cyber crimes. You know, and that first circle of unity at, is at the company level where everyone in the company contributes to reduce the spread of cybersecurity threats. Uh, research says that when you increase cybersecurity awareness, you reduce cybersecurity risk. And the report I'm referring to is one that is from the Cybersecurity Tech Accord. This is a group of 130 global tech companies that have signed on to work together to foster collaboration on a more secure online world. And that includes like Microsoft and Cisco and Dell and Unisys. And the report says that cybersecurity awareness um, is the most critical piece to secure companies in the midst of accelerating threats and attacks. And so I mean, quickly, what does that look like? What does that culture look like? And it's more than just the um, email training to guard against phishing attacks. It's about having difficult conversations with vendors to make sure that their software products are more secure. It's investing time and resources into ups upskilling our individuals and ensuring that we build out security ops or invest more in appliances. So, one one aspect at the company level and then as i talked about in the slide then there's that larger whole of nation approach that those reports really get into and that's how you kind of you know unify more at a higher national level pause pause for now thank you david um you spent a lot of time on um which is great uh, information on the you know what happens after the hack what are the costs, the numbers, uh, who causes it, all that kind of thing. But um, a real question is, and there's a kind of a misnomer, or there's at least a myth that companies just don't even design uh, security into their products and services, that security gets added as an afterthought. You're in the uh, world of uh, glo or corporate uh, cybersecurity. Is that true? Is it changing? Is there more companies can do now to put security into their programs before they go live with them to help reduce these? Um, all these uh, risks of loss on the part of business? 
Sure, that's a great question. Uh, I think to some extent that is true still. Um, I think one of the big problems is that we still have systems that were designed 20, 30 years ago before any of these risks even have existed. And when you attach those systems and networks and then to the internet, you know, those systems for sure were never designed with this, with these threats in mind. They just weren't. And to go back and change those, especially when they're, they were built and the people who built them are no longer there. And, you know, that talent is hard to find now. That can be a very difficult task for a company, company to do. That said, um, there are, the, the field itself is really, matured in how it deals with developing software securely. And there, there are very good processes for that now. And there's, we're always adapting those. And when you look at, you know, legacy mainframe technology, everything from mainframe, well, I shouldn't say mainframe, you know, Windows and Linux up to, you know, the newer cloud technologies, um, we have processes now to deal with those different types of technology. Now, that all costs money, of course. So you, you in any kind of risk management program, you go after the biggest risks because you can't fix everything. I think Secretary Simon said it very well. There's no guarantees, nothing's ever 100%, and there's no finish line. And I think as long as you operate with that mindset, I think um, you learn to, to look for the risks that are most important to mitigate those. So I think that is still commonly held to your original question, Janet. That, that is a commonly held, um, I think, view that things are designed or security is an afterthought, and that does still happen, obviously, but we are getting better at it. Thank you. Secretary Simon, uh, first of all, you're very popular, getting a lot of questions already. So, <laughs> but, so I, I'm going to combine a couple of uh, guests' questions, uh, audience questions, uh, with my original question I had for you. In your presentation, you use the term, we are a paper ballot state. Right. And so I was going to just generally ask, uh, for how long? I mean, is this, do you think we'll continue with the current system for a long time? Or is it going to become outdated and we're going to go to something different? And we are getting, and we'll ask some questions of you in the, in the second round in terms of, of the next election, but already people are asking, are we, are we going to go to online voting? What, what is the future going to look like for us as voters? And then since it's cybersecurity, how safe will that be? Yes. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Janet. Uh, thank you to Norway House and, and thanks to everyone who's involved in this program. It's a pleasure to be with you. So I, 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 the probably the most common question over the last few years that I have uh, received is the question about will we ever have online voting? We have online voter registration and have had for a few years. Uh, you just go to mnvotes.org and you can register online and do a lot of things. Um, so, But we don't have online voting. And my simple answer is that I can't see it at any time in the near future. Now, there's an asterisk by that. And as the other experts on the panel can tell you with far more technical knowledge than I can, I can't tell you what kind of um, technological breakthrough might come in a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade that would make our current concerns seem quaint. Uh, maybe I and, and others just lack the imagination at this point, but I can tell you based on available information right now, I don't think online voting is secure, period. And I can't foresee a situation in the next many years when that would be ca the case. There are some very small scale experiments going on in some states with very, very tiny populations. Um, but those, frankly, in my view and, and others' view, uh, uh, those are vulnerable. And those make voters' votes uh, vulnerable and subject to um, uh, all sorts of mischief. So uh, I mentioned that we're a paper ballot state and your question was, is that gonna go away? No, I don't think it is. It's kind of an irony, isn't it? That um, in, this, uh, in this age, good old fashioned paper is really our safe harbor. And I can tell you at the legislature, because I used to be in the legislature, there is a rock solid bipartisan consensus in favor of paper ballots. I don't see that dissolving anytime soon either. It just goes to show you that sometimes low tech is better than high tech. And this is one of those vanishingly rare examples where when it comes to elections and voting, good old fashioned pen and paper is a lot safer than some of the alternatives in wide use in other states. So I think we're gonna stick with pen and paper for a long, long time. And I can't foresee, I don't have the technological know-how and knowledge personally to see, maybe the other panelists can't, I can't see any time in the near future when we would ever go to online voting. Okay, that's a direct answer. <laughs> so. Uh, General Horvath, I have a question. I'm going to combine it with a question I've already gotten from the audience for, the, for you. 
Um, again, going to your opening remarks, which were very uh, thorough, um, it seems as though any kind of management or governance of the internet seems to be very diffuse. You've got consortiums, you've got private industry, it's just a wide range of things and we're hoping to pull them all together. Well, who actually has jurisdiction for the cyberspace? I mean, is there somebody who actually has jurisdiction to like it or not make the rules of the road? And the question that's come from the audience is what about inappropriate behavior on the internet? We're certainly hearing of that with, um, uh, with some of the things that are um, being freely published on. So does somebody or some entity have jurisdiction or should they and how is it going to come along? That I can answer that question in five words. No, <laughs> not, 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 not even close. We'll, we'll focus first on, on jurisdiction and, you know, that being the, like the official power to make decisions and judgments regarding cyber crimes. So the U.S. courts are making judgments and charging perpetrators of cyber crimes. Uh, the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section that is under the Criminal Division of the DOJ investigates um, cybercrime. And you can look on the DOJ's uh, website and you'll see several press releases that cite examples across the nation where individuals are being charged and sentenced for cybercrimes um, ranging from like cyber stalking, because that is definitely a thing, and an, an unfortunate aspect of, you know, it's definitely not appropriate behavior on the internet that that's happening. And then you have email fraud, and then how about um, the theft of intellectual property? So the DOJ also has a intellectual property task force that is successfully prosecuting individuals who have stolen intellectual property. So one example is a case in February where a Chinese national scientist was sentenced for downloading and stealing documents from the U.S. Petro company that he was working for. So there are more, we have more and more, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, I think it's good that more individuals are being prosecuted uh, for computer crimes because that will set precedent and it just, it puts potential cyber criminals on, on alert that they should be aware that we are now a little more organ, more and more organized for um, charging cyber, cyber criminals. And just to talk about who else is involved in an investigation, the FBI is the lead agency for investigating cyber crimes. And the FBI has the, the IC3, the Internet Crime Complaint Center, and that's where complaints uh, kind of like the repository, a place for people and organizations to record um, the cybercrime and for just to start an investigation. I'll bring up one other point about um, appropriate behavior in the cyber domain or on the internet at an international level. There is an interesting initiative with the UN and the Cyber Tech Accord. And so I think it's very interesting because you have an uh, intergovernmental agency policymaker that is working with leading global techs to develop and um, develop a collaborative solution for more safety and security on, you know, online, in the internet, um, in helping to reinforce more appropriate behavior. Uh, back thank over to you, Janet. Okay, thank you. David, I'm going to uh, incorporate again a good question from our audience. Uh, and it has to do with the um, when there is a breach. You've talked about the high cost of them and what it takes. Mm -hmm. But uh, just from a consumer standpoint, it, when there's a breach, once you, can you just briefly kind of describe what happens inside a company other than you know yell fire? Uh, but uh, this is a consumer question, which is, do you have a duty to inform consumers? Um, they, they, the person who asked the question says it feels like it's months later before we hear about a hack. So, and, um, and sort of part of that is, so that whole question of how can consumers get more protection? So from a corporate standpoint, what goes on, who do you call and what is the duty you have to consumers? Sure. Um, unfortunately that's an, it depends answer. Um, and it, it, 
it depends on what legal jurisdiction you are actually operating in. Um, so if you are in a state like California, which has very rigorous notification laws and privacy laws, some of the most rigorous in the country, um, you have to notify pretty quickly. Now that can all, that can be delayed if it's a significant breach or something new or law enforcement is involved and they want to actually figure out who's doing this. Sometimes that notification period will be extended while they do the investigation. So the perpetrators can actually get be caught. Because oftentimes as soon as you shut down the breach, the perpetrators, the hackers know it and they scatter and you'll never get them. Uh, so it, it's a balancing act between what's the damage being done versus a, a weight against future damage that those hackers may cause. So it's it's not always a simple, you know, not, notify as quickly as possible. And sometimes you don't even know the details yet, enough details to know what to tell people. So I think it's obviously you want to do everything you possibly can to protect uh, the consumer and their data and everything else. And there's just some extenuating circumstances sometimes that may lengthen that out. Um, there are some cases, and I won't name them because it, can't recall them off the top of my head, but it, it does go too far and those companies do get sanctioned for it um, because they, they didn't really follow the law wherever they are. And that's, whether it's the United States or even in Europe or Asia Pacific, all the laws are different than being a, if you're a global company, you have to know about all of them. And the data privacy practices now and some of these global companies are, are very um, comprehensive and very sophisticated because they have to track data privacy regulations in the United States. And, and we have a patchwork in the US. So every, every state has their own almost every state. So there's you know, 40 plus different laws on the books right now in the different states. And there are international laws and there are, you know, Germany, UK, Australia, Japan have some of the more rigorous ones than the, in the European Union um, GDPR uh, Act as well. Those are all very, um, those are all very serious laws and you have to, you have to respect those when you do business in those jurisdictions. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, Secretary Simon, as I said, you're very popular. We've got a number of questions. Uh, they all are really focusing in on the election this fall. So um, they, they come in kind of different flavors. But basically, mail-in ballots, whether they're absentee or simply just mail-in ballots that are allowed, how, how secure are they? There's obviously some questions being raised about the security of them. Um, what, what do you think could become a disruptive uh, election this fall. We don't know if there'll be a second uh, wave of the virus. And so, um, you know, what are you and the other secretaries thinking about in terms of should people plan ahead and do absentee ballots, not, you know. And of course, we just saw a fairly chaotic situation in Georgia today with the um, people saying they didn't get their ballots in time, didn't know if they should. Anyway, just a lot of confusion. So, yep. What what is, are you awake at two in the morning, you and all secretaries of the state, wondering how this is going to go, or what do you want to tell us about what we should expect uh, as we head towards the big election this fall? Yeah, it's on my mind and my colleagues in other states' minds a lot. You can imagine. Um, for the last two months, I've been using Wisconsin as the example of what not to be and how not to be. Now, starting today, we can use Georgia as well. And I'm talking about a situation with long lines, angry voters people who were shut out unnecessarily. And that's really unfortunate. We want to avoid that in Minnesota and everywhere else. I think we have to treat these elections, I say plural, because we have an August 11th primary and a November 3rd general election. Both are statewide elections. We have to treat them as a public health issue this year. We don't know what the world's going to look like in August or November. Nobody on this meeting does. But we have to assume the worst and hope for the best. That's the most responsible. That's the sanest and safest thing to do. And so to me, um, uh, that means um, trying to get the numbers at the polling places down. The CDC is very clear. You could Google them right now and look at their guidance. They basically say, I'm paraphrasing, if you can, try to find alternate modes of voting so you don't have to expose yourself to a polling place. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what they say. 66% of Americans, according to a recent Pew survey, say that they are uncomfortable. That's the word that they used, uncomfortable going to a polling place at a time of a pandemic. I think people are trying to tell us something. And I think we ought to listen to what they're trying to tell us. So in Minnesota, we are really uh, amping up uh, our efforts to get people to vote from home this year. We have a no excuses absentee law, have had since 2013. This is nothing new or radical. 
meaning any one of us who's eligible to vote can simply go to mnvotes.org, that's our website, mnvotes.org, and can order that ballot to come to them at home. And Minnesotans are already doing that in great numbers. We gotta get the numbers even higher so that we can drive the overall numbers at the polling place lower. Um, just to give you the simple math right now, um, we have about 3,000 polling places in Minnesota, and we're expecting about 3 million voters. I'm rounding, but basically that's about a thousand to one ratio of people to polling place. We gotta get that number way down. So I'm encouraging people to vote by mail by going to mnvotes.org, and I'm encouraging people to consider being an election judge or a polling place worker, but that's a separate issue. As to the security of that system, that absentee system, I am quite, quite confident in its security. Now, sometimes I get this kind of pushback, and I don't blame people. I think it's a legitimate question. Some people will say, hey, what about something like mailbox theft? If someone knows that the city of Minneapolis, for example, is mailing out all its ballots on a Wednesday to the people who have requested them, what if some clever thief hangs out by mailboxes on the following two or three days, hoping to snag for himself two or five or 10 or 100 ballots so he can vote them all? What happens then? And the answer is that in Minnesota for a long, long time, um, unless that thief or that would-be thief has the personal identifying information of the intended voter, his plan will be foiled. It will not work and that ballot will be spoiled and it won't be counted. So when you go to mnvotes.org, you'll notice, and I hope all of you will do that tonight, uh, as I did, as my wife has done. Um, if you go to mnvotes.org and order it to come to you, you'll notice that you have to supply something. So last four of social security, driver's license number, and some uh, circumstances, other personal identifying information. So unless the thief, knows not only your information, but which kind of information you supplied when you applied for that ballot, he's not gonna be successful. So uh, I think we have a very secure system. No one should worry about mailbox theft or ballots just sort of floating out there for anyone to vote, that just doesn't happen. And empirically, when you look back in the rearview mirror, I asked our elections director and others who have been at this for a lot longer than I have, for decades and decades, and I asked them, can you recall a case, a single case, of mailbox theft where someone voted someone's mail ballot and they shouldn't have, and they can't recall it. Doesn't mean it hasn't happened, it means they can't recall it in decades of doing this work. Well, good, that's reassuring. <laughs> so, um, we just a quick follow-up question. It's along the same line. We had another uh, a participant ask, how safe is the um, voter registration, the online voter registration mm -hmm. be hacked? Just a, a number of things. So. Yeah, uh, it's very safe. As a matter of fact, um, uh, when that uh, law was passed in 2013, the legislature, I think, wisely required that the Office of Secretary of State annually do a full report on the security of that system, which we must and which we do. So we have to detail potential breaches or actual breaches. We have to detail um, the, the protocols that we have in place. We have to talk about our systems, and we have to do that on an annual basis. We can't just let it slip. We can't just let it sort of slide away. And so that has forced us um, and, and all secretaries of state um, to be really vigilant about that. So I feel very good about the system from a security standpoint. Good, thank you. General Horvath, I think you teased our audience with uh, two uh, very uh, intriguing words, dark web. So um, <laughs> would you, uh, got a couple of questions, and they, but they all kind of go to, you know, tell us a little bit more about the dark web. I realize that you could go on and on, but just basically the dark web, how do we manage or regulate anything on the dark web? Will it just get worse as computing power goes, gets faster and faster? So um, maybe just uh, either scare people or reassure them a little bit about the dark web. Okay, well, I suppose you could scare them a little bit by, here's a, here's a good uh, book for everyone to read. Click here to kill everybody. Everybody, uh, it's Bruce Schneier, um, and I'm not affiliated with Bruce at all. And I, I know this is not a marketing ploy, um, but he goes into into aspects of either the dark web or the where we are at now, or and why we are um, in this state. The dark web emerged as a a web only really smart um, IT minded people knew how to get to where they could kind of disguise place a cloak over their traffic or the web pages that they could get to um, you'll hear the tour or the onion router 
which basically is this proxy, right? So people, when, if I, on my computer, go to Google or eBay, they're identifying characteristics of my computer and that server that I'm going to. But the Tor and the whole dark web allows this cloak um, so that the sender, um, you cannot read who that person is. You can't read who what that computer that computer is, and and then the server is also kind of um, veiled, and so it has just become um, it's grown because it's it's just become this area where people can go and look for whatever they want to look for, and you can about uh, imagine what people look for, and then now it's also become a tremendous marketplace. And so that's the dark web. And there's, there's a lot more information um, out there. As far as the control or containment of the dark web, you know, I really, I cannot say what or who is involved. Um, there is, you know, threat intelligence, I think, that looks into the dark web, but, you know, I cannot expound um, further, because I, I just really don't know. It's not really my area of expertise. But I mean, it is uh, an intriguing aspect of of human and and the um, human behavior kind of manifesting itself in the digital domain. If um, there is greater government and consortium effort to develop rules for the road for the internet, is the dark web untouchable is it off limits or is it just nobody has broken through yet and it created the capability to see what's there and manage what's there so you know there the diplomacy is one way to try to drive more appropriate behavior um, can we absolutely stop our dark web. I think that's why there's a kind of a race for technology. Um, at some point, encryption really becomes important. So if you can encrypt your traffic and nobody can see it, that's very powerful. And so I think there are diplomatic efforts and then there's technological efforts. Um, and it is definitely kind of a race. And that's why I go back to the importance of that cyber tech accord, the cybersecurity tech accord, where you have 130 um, leading global IT companies, whether it's Cisco or Unisys or Microsoft or Dell, and they're all collaborating together. And so that is, um, that's a, a lot of technical prowess coming together to drive uh, technology in a direction for the good. I mean, we're really, this is the contemporary instrument of, how, of what people can use, you know, and it's how they use it is what really matters. And so how they use the internet for good or for illicit uh, nefarious reasons. Uh, back to you, I know that doesn't really answer the question about you know, who's going to deconstruct the dark web. I don't know that that's a feasi feasible um, possibility. Okay. David, one is, I think from uh, one of our uh, participants is maybe just a follow-up to your previous uh, answer. So I'll do that first and then I'll combine it with the second one, which is simply, do you think uh, Minnesota will uh, adopt stronger consumer protection laws uh, similar to California. And then the other one that came in is a more specific to your industry. As more and more people have medical devices in their bodies and otherwise, um, what are the risks? I mean, are, are hackers, I mean, what, what's the, the risk that somebody could hack in and, and cause physical or health damage to you as a result of your device? Sure. So the, the first one, uh, as far as additional consumer protections in Minnesota. I, I think that's just a general trend nationally, is that as we understand more of the damage that can be done and um, we're trying to really standardize how we treat this thing so that our, the states aren't so disparate in how they handle privacy because 
as a Minnesota resident, I may have accounts in California that are managed by California companies. So which jurisdiction applies and which, you know, those sorts of things, they get to be pretty complicated questions, then throw in the international component to it. And it's, it's almost untenable from a legal standpoint. Um, with respect to uh, medical devices and frankly, IOT in general, um, any kind of devices, cars, automobiles, anything that has a computer in it, that's not a, what you would consider a classical type of computer. Um, you can do, um, there is certainly the opportunity to do it. There are publicized public cases of devices, uh, medical and otherwise, where it is, it was shown that you can hack them in certain ways. Uh, they generally have certain stipulations, like you have to be a certain distance from it, close enough, let's say for the Bluetooth to be able to connect, you can't do it from across the planet. Um, but there are instances where, you know, those things are of concern and certainly we take that sort of thing very seriously. And, um, and it's, it's, it's going to be an issue. And I think you're the opening statement where we're connecting everything and every, anything and everything to the internet, um, cars, medical devices, and, and consumers want that, frankly, that's what they ask for. They, they, it's convenience. It's, it enables new features, functionality. They can, frankly, take better care of their health too. They can monitor themselves more closely and their doctors can monitor them more closely and the outcomes are better. So we have to really balance things that we do to these devices to make people's lives better and healthier and safer with what risks are we introducing at the same time and really being able to look at both sides of that and make the proper risk uh, decisions. So. Okay, Secretary Simon, this is a, Another question about this fall. We're kind of digging deeper and deeper about this fall. You certainly indicated in your past answer how hard you, secretaries of state, are working to make it a safe election. But we already know there are um, groups with political agendas who are already questioning or, or suggesting at least that regardless of how safe the elections are or regardless of who wins or loses, somebody's going to claim they're not legitimate. So uh, is that a topic you, secretaries of state, I mean, you're the ones that the morning after the election are gonna be on you know, cable television and everything else talking about the, the election. So are there, are there metrics or, or, or anything where you can point to things and say, you know, we can't answer all the suspicions, but we can certainly answer to show that these were safe and legitimate elections. Yes, it is a topic of concern. Um, it is layered, of course, with politics. Unfortunately, it shouldn't be, but it is. Um, and it's something we think about a lot. It's been said a lot in the elections world that um, the test of a, a good election is one that the, that the losers can accept, right? No matter where. And so you have to make sure you run an election that way. We always try and we've by and large succeeded in Minnesota over the years and decades. It is something we think about. And that's why secretaries of state of both parties are really engaged and involved together in trying to push back against disinformation and misinformation about the process. We are not, and I am not, the campaign cops, okay? It's not our job. In fact, it would probably be improper for us to get involved or for me to get involved refereeing who said what about whom in a political campaign. That's not our role. Um, but it is our role to push back against disinformation and misinformation as to elections. Uh, a, a, a cartoonishly uh, extreme example would be you know, if you see a flyer or something online saying, hey, you know, A through L votes on Tuesday and M through Z votes on Wednesday. Um, that's something you push against. But, but similarly, I and others of my colleagues are pushing against other disinformation or misinformation, for example, about absentee ballots, about how they somehow open the door to fraud or how somehow, you know, dead people are going to be sent ballots or that kind of thing. I have pushed back and will continue to push back strongly against facts that are just plain wrong and assertions that are just not grounded in anything that seem to be made up on the spot. I'm going to continue to do that. That's not partisan. I'll take all comers. I don't care whether it comes from a Democrat or Republican. If you say something that's false about the election system, that is just demonstrably false, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to make some noise about it. And so are my colleagues in other states of both parties. That's the best thing we can do. Now, if there are people after the fact, the day after, the week after, who think that there was um, misconduct of some kind, then you know, that's something else altogether. But if they just say that sort of systemically it was unfair to them and therefore illegitimate, that's something we all have to push back against. Um, that's something that happens in other countries. 
Um, and that's not something that should happen in the United States in 2020. Good. General, we have received a couple of questions, uh, and which are clearly for you. You come from a military uh, background and you work, you're a co-chair of the consortium. Um, a couple of questions that deal with um, foreign players, foreign actors. How real is this concern that there are countries out there either tampering with our elections as, as uh, Secretary Simon has referred to, or just other things, you know, our military codes or, wh or whatever, you know. Um, how real is it? Is everybody doing it? I mean, are we doing it? Is everybody doing it? And you just have to, you're, you're just constantly batting away um, bad actors. Are there some that do it more often than others and they're, they're at the top of the list? So just a couple of questions coming in about, tell us more about foreign actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So there is a lot of activity, <laughs> bottom line. Um, and I would point to the cyberspace solarium as a way to kind of outline, you know, terabytes and terabytes of information on um, actors and actions going on in the internet that are of national interest and national concern. And the reason why that report was assembled was to marshal government resources and change government structure to deal with um, this competition in the cyber domain. I mean, the report itself, the Cyberspace Solarium Report is 186 pages long. And it is dealing with changes that Congress is supposed to make, development of new um, parts of government, and ongoing um, research and development into the technology, into a variety of technologies from encryption to um, AI, machine learning, um, identity, how we're going to deal with identity. And so all of um, those parts are to deal with the threats and the the threats emanating in cybersecurity. So yes, there's very, um, there's a lot of information explaining that there's a lot happening. And so that's why that report was put together was how do we develop a whole nation approach to deal with um, securing our information assets, ensuring we do our organizations don't lose intellectual property, um, ensure that, um, Aircraft details aren't stolen. These are there's just a wide variety of examples that are either listed in open source, like the the Department of Justice site. Um, I think what comes next is, you know, how do we, you know, calm or establish the understanding, a good understanding, have a calm um, and succinct and systemic approach to dealing and grappling with securing the cyber domain. And that's why it's, you know, there's, is it an internet? Is it securing online um, or is it an entire domain? And I would tell you that DOD is looking at it as an entire domain uh, and one that we have to, that it is a vital national interest to secure that domain. Uh, and so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of intelligence that supports. There's a lot of competition in this region. And you, you have now two significant national reports, uh, the Moonshot Initiative and the Cyberspace Solarium Report that are really organizing. Uh, it's a dramatic approach to organizing government to deal with securing the cyber domain. Are there any particular foreign players you think are at the top of the list? Oh, you know, I suppose, yes, there are. And I think they're all watching right now. Um, you know, certainly we see either China, Russia, um, North Korea. And so, but there are, there are others. I mean, it, there really are 
um, others for a variety of different reasons. So I don't know that, um, so, you know, knowing the actors is one thing, but I think knowing what to do is really where the work has to go. You know, where our interests, where our efforts have to go is how are we going to um, secure all instruments of national power and ensure our organizations and individuals have um, the ability or have some, you know, assurance of cybersecurity to do what they want to do, run a business, um, be able to uh, buy, purchase online, everything in civil society, uh, things that we have come to really enjoy that ride over the internet. I mean, we really, it has to be a national interest now to secure that internet. Okay. David, you are, um, from our questions from the audience, somewhat seen as our consumer uh, expert here. Um, I think uh, <laughs> part of your career is that you were uh, the head of a cybersecurity firm at one time. So uh, a number of questions, so three or four different uh, members of the audience have asked about um, security of things like, how do I secure my passwords? Uh, how safe is it to buy products on the uh, online and give your your uh, credit card. I mean, just all kinds of personal things. And then, and, and kind of, and a, another person asked, what are some tools? Now, you did mention one website in your opening where you can go to look at some, some uh, advice. But what's the best place for someone to look on the internet to try to keep up with all these risks and what the individual should be doing? Yeah, so that, that website I shared is, is a good place to start and just monitor that because that does get updated as these things evolve. I would say this, there's, so I do all that. I bank online, I buy things online, my credit cards get compromised, someone steals it from some merchant that I gave it to. Um, and I just, I get it replaced and then it gets credited back by the credit card company. So it's inconvenient um, in that respect, but I still do it. This, this would be my advice, the two things that I personally do and would recommend is number one, your passwords are probably the most important thing you have. Um, do not reuse your passwords for any site that you consider important. So never reuse your banking. If you bank at Wells Fargo or US Bank, do not reuse that password anywhere else. Make sure it's strong. You know, and by strong, I mean 12 characters, not the eight that you see everywhere. It's, it's really 12 or better typically what I do. Um, because what happens is if you remember back a few years, LinkedIn got hacked and there was millions of passwords stolen. What happens when that, when that happens, um, those hackers will take that, you know, 30, 40 million passwords and they will just ram it down the website at all the banks and they'll see who's reused their username and password on LinkedIn as the same thing for their, web, their banking site. And there's a, not a small percentage of those that hit. Um, so that's why you just really can't reuse passwords for any of the sites that you consider important. I saw one come up here too about, you know, storing photos in the cloud and doing that sort of thing. And um, again, um, multi-factor, if you're an iCloud, use their multi-factor authentication. Uh, same thing with Google, same thing with any of those cloud providers, if they offer it. And actually if they don't offer it, I would think twice about using them. Um, but all the big cloud providers have some options for multi-factor and the banks do too now. You can order that as a separate add-on. It's not often obvious, but if you look through the fine printer caller customer service, sometimes you can get two-factor or multi-factor enabled on your bank accounts too, which is a big uh, significant benefit. So that's the one thing, just really manage your passwords really well. And you can, you can go out and get password managers because those that number of passwords adds up pretty quickly. Um, I have hundreds of them. So I have to manage that with a password manager. Uh, which means that you have a single really long password that unlocks an encrypted database of your passwords. And then inside that database is all your other passwords for those sites. So you don't have to remember all the passwords, um, but it's a way that you can have strong passwords and not start forgetting them and have to reset accounts and all that. The second thing is email, links and email, just don't click on it ever. Um, that's the other way. And I, that one slide in my intro, Passwords and phishing were the two, the two largest ways that people break into accounts and break into companies. So watch your email and watch your passwords. Good advice. Secretary Simon, we like to keep our programs on time, whether they're um, online or in person. So you'll get the last uh, question. 
and I hope you'll uh, take this in the spirit in which uh, I think our um, our guest asked it, uh, and that is, uh, there's a lot riding on having safe elections and, and trustworthy elections for democracy, and yet there's kind of a kind of a perception that you know government is way behind in terms of the systems they use and the the, um, the quality of their systems and the state of the art of their systems. So. Um, do you have the resources you need? I mean, do you feel that you are adequately resourced to assure the voters of Minnesota of safe elections? Well, I can say that um, I feel very good about where we are today. As I said in my opening uh, uh, taped presentation, there's never a 100% guarantee. Uh, I, I can't sit here and tell you there's a 100% chance nothing bad will happen. I just can't. No one can, honestly. But I can say we're taking all the steps that we should and all the steps that we can with the resources we have available. Could we use more resources? Yes, we could. Every single one of my colleagues around the country would say the same thing. Uh, but, um, you know, we have a very strong partnership with the federal government, in particular with the intelligence agencies, who routinely do a lot with us and for us to make sure that our systems are as secure as possible. Again, not 100% guarantee, but they will typically come into our office do a week's worth of remote um, testing and a week's worth of in-person testing where they try to get into our systems. They look for vulnerabilities. They write up a report that lets us know what holes we need to plug. Um, and then we plug them and then we're doing that. And so I feel very good about where we are, but no one is absolutely impregnable. Uh, that said, because we're a paper ballot state and because uh, no one's gonna get burned uh, uh, as somewhere in 2016, or surprised, I should say, I think we're in a very, very good spot. Um, we have a lot of advantages of a as a state in Minnesota that other states don't, and we can capitalize on those for that for this election. I mean, the one caveat is, uh, though I feel very good about election security, generally speaking, now we've got this added and extra wrinkle with COVID-19, which introduces new variables and new challenges into the system, which may and not be related to security, but it's just going to be a challenging 147 days, that's for sure. But I'm an optimist. I'm always an optimist about our system. There's a reason others copy us as a state when it comes to our elections. This is one of them. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. And thank you all for joining us for our first webinar program. And to say this was an experiment is to, uh, is to put it lightly. In fact, we got a question uh, from one of our uh, participants. Why are you using Zoom if it's uh, cybersecurity is your topic? And I will say this is our first one. It's the uh, technology we felt uh, the most people had the most access to and the most uh, comfort with. But we, uh, as we, if we do more of these webinars going forward, uh, we will certainly look more at uh, the security of the technology we use. So we appreciate uh, the constructive criticism. Um, in closing, I would like to thank um, everyone who helped us make this first experimental uh, webinar a success. I would like to thank our speakers. Uh, one uh, shortcoming of a webinar is we can't give you all a big round of applause, but um, I know that everyone does send you their appreciation for tonight's thoughtful discussion. As a token of our appreciation, we do have a very special gift for you. Um, to recognize the peacekeeping role of Norway, as I mentioned in our opening remarks, and also our Native American heritage, we have for you a Native American sacred pipe made from Minnesota Native Pipestone. And I don't know how readily you can see it on the screen, but it looks like this, and uh, it will be provided to each of you, and we hope you will keep it uh, as a memento of uh, of this uh, evening. I would like to thank the board of the Norway House and its executive team, Christina Carlton, Robin Cole, and Max Stevenson. They did a great job developing and executing this webinar. Larry Bakken is the chair of the Minnesota Peace Initiative Committee. And we all extend a very special thank you to Larry for his leadership of the committee. And we also send our appreciation to the committee members for their work and support on this first webinar. We have a great committee, it's a lot of fun, and we invite you to join our committee. We would love to have you join us. I encourage all of you to visit the Norway House website. This webinar will be available as will the slides. 
You can also learn a lot about the Norway House, its mission, and its upcoming events, including next Tuesday's online Midsummer Gala. I also urge you to contribute to the capital campaign to build a new Norway House. We break ground this fall. We have raised 14 million of our $16 million goal, so your contributions could put us over the top. Going back to where we began this program, we want to reiterate again our support for the Lake Street community. There are several websites available to which you can contribute to help rebuild our community. Our next program will be this fall, probably November. As you may have heard, there's an election this fall, so it's going to be an exciting time. We certainly hope we can all be together in person, but if not, we will do another webinar. We appreciate very much your patience with this first webinar, and we look forward to seeing you either online or in person at our next program. To exit this program, just tap leave meeting at the top of your screen. Good night.